of American Finance's Lunch and Learn. Hi, I'm David Callen, president of the museum, and our guest today is NYU uh, adjunct associate professor Roy Germano. Roy is also a research scholar at the NYU Law School. Uh, his expertise is in a topic that is all over the news, uh, immigration and the issues related to it, as well as in his uh, particular expertise on financial remittances. Uh, to put this in context, the estimates of the amount of remittances from the developed to the developing world is $450 billion annually. Roy has also written, directed, and produced multiple award-winning documentaries and short films on immigration. He's been interviewed by a wide variety of outlets, including CNN, MSNBC, Fox, Univision, and Telemundo. Uh, importantly, Roy is not one of these armchair observers. Uh, his opinions are based on first-hand experiences and field work in places like Mexico and Central America. He's also written extensively on uh, legal issues in law journals at the University of Chicago, uh, Duke, William & Mary, and of course, NYU. His book is Outsourcing Welfare, and I am sure Roy would be happy to autograph it for you afterwards if you're so inclined to purchase it. Roy? Thanks for that kind introduction, David, and uh, thanks to the museum for hosting this talk. And I'm especially grateful to uh, Kristen Aguilera for finding the book and inviting me to come here and speak with you today. Um, it's uh, really an honor to, to be here. This is the first public event for the book, uh, which came out over the summer, and it's many, many years in the making. Um, my work tends to be on immigration, including this book. And we talk a lot about immigration in this country, but the conversation, I feel, tends to be very one-sided. The focus is generally on the impact of immigrants and immigration in the United States. It's not very often that we dis discuss how immigration affects countries that immigrants leave, but the impacts are large and important for us to consider. Of course, many people migrate in search of a better life or to experience some version of the American dream, but many don't. A primary motivation that many people have for going abroad is to work and send money home to support family members and friends who are unable or unwilling to migrate. And for many migrants, the goal is both. On one hand, it's to better their life and to, to seek out the American dream, but also it's to save as much money as possible and send money home. So my new book, Outsourcing Welfare, is about this money, the money that immigrants send to their home countries. And this money is typically referred to as remittances. It's not the most familiar word, uh, but as somebody like me who studied this, it's sort of second nature to be talking about remittances. But I'm not an immigrant, and I hadn't heard this word myself until about 15 years ago when, as a student at the University of Chicago, I took a part-time job waiting tables. And I was studying international relations at the time, and in the late 1990s and early 2000s, it seems like the thing that was on everybody's mind was this buzzword globalization. And people were talking about the increasing interdependence of national economies. But at the restaurant where I worked, I saw globalization with my own eyes on a daily basis. The vast majority of people employed in the kitchen of the restaurant where I worked were born not in the United States, but in places like Mexico, Guatemala, Ecuador, and the former Soviet bloc. A handful of my coworkers had immigrated because they planned to uh, set roots and settle in the United States permanently. But many of my coworkers, I'd say the majority, had come here with a temporary stay in mind, and their goal was to save as much money as possible to send home to their relatives back in the home country. And eventually they planned to return home themselves more prosperous than when they left. I remember one coworker at the restaurant in particular, he was a guy named Leo, and he was a busboy, and he was particularly focused on saving money. Leo was twice my age. Um, he regularly worked double shifts at our restaurant and then sometimes he was picking up breakfast shifts at another restaurant working six or seven days a week. 
And I can still picture that constant look of exhaustion in Leo's face and his sort of bloodshot, tired-looking eyes every day from working seven days a week without any type of break. And back then, I didn't speak much Spanish and Leo didn't speak much English, but we were able to communicate. And over the course of the year that I worked at the restaurant, I got to know him quite well. And through our conversations, I learned that he was really under a great deal of pressure. He once told me that he owned a small business just outside of Mexico City, and it was a, a body shop where he used to work on cars. And the business went bankrupt and went under. And right around that time, Leo found out that his wife had cancer. So he found himself in a very difficult spot. They were uninsured. They didn't have any income coming in. So Leo made the life-changing decision to hire a human smuggler and migrate illegally to the United States. He ended up in Chicago and found a job at this restaurant where we worked together making minimum wage. And he religiously saved the money that he earned from working those jobs and he sent most of it home to feed his kids and pay for his wife's medical care. And after that conversation, it wasn't a mystery to me why Leo was working so hard, why he wasn't taking a day off. For his family, it was literally a matter of life and death that he save and send as much money home as possible. And it was through that experience at working at the restaurant that I became so impressed and so interested in this idea that people were sending money all over the world. And I was fortunate to secure a sizable grant from the National Science Foundation and went on to conduct many years of field work in rural Mexico to understand the reasons why people migrate and how the tens of billions of dollars that they send back to Mexico every year impacts life in Mexico. And since that time, I've never ceased to be impressed by these contributions and the important and often overlooked role that they play in the global economy. The role that remittances play is huge. I'm not sure if you know this, but 250 million people throughout the world are living outside their country of birth. If immigrants all lived in one country, it would be about the fifth largest country in the world. And we have a record number of immigrants living throughout the world these days. A significant share of these people, nobody knows exactly how many, are like Leo sending one and two hundred dollars back at a time to their friends on a regular basis and their family members. Some of them send remittances from Western unions and through banks. Others wire money from internet cafes, 24-hour check cashing shops, currency exchanges owned by co-nationals, or automated kiosks inside of bodegas. Some immigrants send money using the latest text messaging and smartphone mobile apps like World Remit, Remitly, Zoom, while others still send money the old-fashioned way as cash mailed in envelopes or in the pockets of friends who are returning home. No one knows exactly how much money is being sent back precisely because some of this money is difficult to track. If it's cash sent back in suitcases or gifts that are being mailed back, I actually heard of an instance when people used to stuff money inside of stuffed animals and then send it back to their home country that way. But based on records of money that's sent back formally through Western unions and banks and formal channels like this, uh, the World Bank estimates that international migrants transferred a staggering $5 trillion to developing countries between the years 2000 and 2017. And as David mentioned, in 2017 alone, migrants sent an estimated $450 billion to the developing world through formal remitting channels. So this graph puts that number in perspective by comparing government aid to remittances in recent years. And you can see that remittances have grown significantly while the flow of aid has held relatively constant. And the gap between remittances and aid reached its highest point yet in 2014 when international migrants sent an estimated $444 billion back to their home countries, while meanwhile the governments of the world's richest countries donated about $135 billion in the form of aid and official development assistance. And I think this point is really worth emphasizing. International migrants, many of whom, like Leo, are earning very little and doing jobs that few other people want, do more than three times as much toward fighting poverty in the developing world than the, the governments and taxpayers of the world's richest countries. Remittances are a large and important source of income in dozens of de developing countries throughout the world. 
The top remittance receiving countries are India and China, which receive just over $60 billion each. Uh, the next largest remittance receiving countries are Philippines with about $30 billion in 2016, Mexico with close to $30 billion on pace for $33 billion this year, Pakistan with about $20 billion, and Nigeria as well at about $19 billion. But when we just look at remittances in total dollar amounts, we overlook the many small countries where remittances are a huge and important aspect of the local economy. So we can compare remittances to the size of local economies. Remittances aren't taken account in the GDP calculation, but we can compare them to GDP and see that they're huge relative to the size of the, uh, to the domestic economy in many small countries. So for example, they're worth more than 20% of GDP in places like Nepal, Liberia, Tajikistan, Haiti, Moldova, equivalent to more than 10% of GDP in places like Honduras, Jamaica, El Salvador, Lebanon, Senegal, Georgia, and Guatemala. Overall, remittances are equivalent to, G to more than 5% of GDP in more than 50 developing countries throughout the world. Another way that we can measure remittances is by looking at the percentage of the population in various countries that receives remittances. And again, the numbers are, are pretty staggering here. In some small island countries like Haiti and Jamaica, half the population receives remittances at least once a year. Uh, they make up a large share in other countries. For example, a third of the population living in Senegal and Zimbabwe receive remittances at least occasionally. And roughly a fifth of the populations of the Dominican Republic, Burkina Faso, Ghana, Honduras, and El Salvador receive remittances. So I think this money is, is impressive on one hand, because it's such a huge source of income that so many people receive, but I think it's also impressive because migrants tend to send this money altruistically. So if you compare remittances to loans or investment flows, there's usually no extremes attached when it comes to remittances. Rarely do migrants expect that the money will be pay back, paid back or that it will be used to turn a profit. Like my friend Leo at the restaurant, many people remit do so because they feel a sense of duty to family and genuine concern for the welfare of their relatives, friends, and family members. And because altruism is so often the driving force behind the decision to send money home, migrants tend to send more money when people back home are facing some sort of crisis or emergency. For example, I recently interviewed a woman named Alana who migrated to New York City in 2006 from Trinidad and Tobago. And Alana supports herself and her three kids, all of whom live with her here in the United States with money she earns working as a nanny and doing other side jobs like braiding hair. So then after looking at her finances, she takes whatever amount she can afford, usually about $200 a month, and sends that extra money to relatives in Trinidad. But in addition to that regular $200 that she sends, she often sends extra money home when relatives send her text messages or call her saying that they need extra. And she said this usually happens when food prices are rising in Trinidad or when family members have a medical emergency. When I asked Alana if she ever expects to be re repaid even for these extra amounts that she sends home, she unequivocally said never. And then she went on to say, if somebody back home calls me and says, I don't have food at my house, I think, what if I didn't have food? So I send them money. When I give, I know a blessing will come back to me, so I don't look back for anything from the person I'm doing it for. Like Alana's household, remittances are a critical lifeline for millions of poor families throughout the world. And although some of them are invested in income-generating ventures like small businesses and agriculture, or made uh, into long-term investments in activity, activities like healthcare and education, the vast, vast majority of remittances are spent on immediate consumption needs. So this is from a survey that I conducted in 10 Mexican communities while doing research for this book. And these communities had uh, very high rates of out-migration to the United States, and uh, many families in the communities that I was working in received remittances. And when I asked people, what's the number one use of remittances in your household, uh, the vast majority of people who received remittances said that food is the most common item they purchase with this money. And then when I asked them to name the top three things that they use remittances to buy, people mentioned food 30% of the time, 
medicine and health care 21 percent of the time uh, paying for utilities like gas electricity water 18 percent of the time and then after that was clothing 10 percent and then education four percent of the time and you can find similar uh, spending patterns of remittances like this throughout the developing world in surveys that have been conducted in in all regions and hands down in, in every region of the world, the number one purchase re with remittances is food, followed by health care and medicine. And so by allowing households to continue consuming even when local economic conditions are unfavorable, unfavorable, remittances reduce poverty, raise standards of living, and give family more freedom, more uh, margin of error to make long-term investments in housing, education, and health. Obviously, the people who benefit most from remittances are, are the people who are receiving the money themselves. But the positive effects of this money often extends to other people in the community when remittances stimulate local spending and commerce, uh, when remittances uh, recipients, for example, spend money on food at local markets that goes into the pockets of the food vendors, when they buy new appliances at local shops that goes in the pockets of the people who own those shops and allows them to uh, to hire new people and then stimulates another round of spending. 